Good afternoon. Uh, welcome to today's Dean's Distinguished Lecture. Uh, as you may know, we started this tradition a couple of years ago to bring back our most interesting and successful alumni to have lunch with our students and talk about uh, a topic of their choice. And uh, today's distinguished lecture certainly uh, fits the pattern of interesting and successful. Uh, Claire Chino is a member of Cornell Law School's class of 1991. She currently serves as the managing executive officer of a Tochu Corporation, a Fortune Global 500 company headquartered in Japan. And she's the president and CEO of Itochu International Incorporated, a subsidiary of Itochu here in New York. Uh, before assuming her position in New York, she was the general counsel of Itochu. And prior to that, she was a partner with an international law firm. And in 2013, when she became the general counsel, uh, Claire was the first female executive officer of any uh, major trading company in Japan. Uh, she's received several awards for her legal work, uh, top 25 in-house counsel in Asia uh, by Asia Legal Business, uh, Asia Pacific's Innovative Lawyer from Financial Times, and she's received a Transformative Leader Award from Inside Counsel. Most recently, in 2018, the California Lawyers Association recognized her as the eighth annual Warren M. Christopher International Lawyer of the Year. As a prominent and dedicated alumna of Cornell Law School, uh, Claire also serves on the Dean's Advisory Council, providing wise advice to me on matters relating to legal education. She's also given me wise sartorial advice. Uh, when I visited Claire in Tokyo a few years ago, the United Airlines plane that I was on, I had a problem with its cargo door and my luggage was stuck in the hold of the plane for 30 hours. Um, and I had no idea uh, where to find a suit in, in Tokyo uh, since Japanese suit sizes run much smaller than American and uh, European sizes. And Claire came to my rescue, helpfully suggested a big and tall store uh, where I was able to find a suit that fit me in time for alumni and law firm meetings. Uh, and I'm very grateful. I should have worn that suit today. I still have it. And it's, uh, it's more of a summer suit. It's not really appropriate for, uh, for our weather today. But it's, uh, it's a, a token of my, of my uh, debt to, uh, to Claire. Claire is also a classically trained singer uh, affiliated with the Juilliard School. And she gives solo uh, performances from time to time. And I just learned that she's going to be giving a solo performance in January uh, at, uh, at Carnegie Hall. Um, but today, we have the privilege of hearing her speak uh, about her journey from Cornell Law School to private practice to the world of in-house uh, counsel and ultimately to the C-suite. So please join me in welcoming Claire Chino back to Cornell Law School. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Eduardo, for that uh, very kind introduction. Uh, it's wonderful to be back here uh, 30 years ago. Uh, this, was, this would have been my second semester first year. Uh, so it's always wonderful to be back. Uh, it's wonderful to see my old young professors, Stuart, Kevin, Glenn. Uh, thank you. And thank you very much uh, for arranging this. Um, I thought I would actually talk about lawyers in the best sense. Uh, so when um, Sean approached me, uh, about this opportunity, I thought about what I can talk about. And I thought maybe I would tackle this very, very difficult topic of lawyers in the best sense. So this banner is everywhere. But I don't think I really thought about what it means to be a lawyer in the best sense. And I think it's a very thought-provoking topic. Um, I also think it's a very personal topic. And by no means, what I have gone through is a best lawyer standard. Uh, as again, I think it's a very personal experience. But hopefully, while listening to me, you would think about what it means for you to be the best lawyer uh, or a, be a lawyer in the best sense. So can I just ask, how many one L's do we have in uh, here? Oh, two, OK. Two L's? So the rest of you are either LLMs, maybe? LLMs, great. OK, and three L's? Oh, we have a good representation, wonderful. All right, so very quickly, I'm going to talk about first my career trajectory. Um, after law school, I moved to California and decided to become a California lawyer. I am originally from Japan, so what I wanted to do was to work for an international law firm that had an office in Tokyo or in New York. Uh, so I interviewed with every single law firm that had an office in either New York or Los Angeles and Tokyo. 
And there were maybe about 18 of them at that time. Uh, I ended up being with a, a firm called Graham and James, which is now Squire Patent Boggs. They placed me in the Newport Beach, California office in 1991. Uh, and I don't know if any of you remember, but the economy was very, very bad in 1991, which meant that the transactional side of things, that was very, very slow. Yet on the bankruptcy and litigation side, we were so busy. So I was putting the, in the litigation department and I became a litigator. Soon thereafter, well, I had you know, been keep on, I was telling my, my law, law firm partners that I wanted to get to Tokyo one of those days and would you please transfer me to the Tokyo office. Um, and they said that uh, there was no opening in Tokyo, but there was an opening in Hong Kong. So why don't you go to Hong Kong first? Hong Kong is close enough to Tokyo, which actually is not, but uh, the, the partner thought Hong Kong was close enough to Tokyo than certainly Newport Beach, California. So I ended up being in Hong Kong because my law firm, uh, Squire Patton Boggs, was affiliated with a Hong Kong law firm at that time. I moved to Hong Kong and there, because I'm not licensed to practice in Hong Kong, I was doing mostly litigation assistance work. So preparing witnesses, mostly Japanese companies, uh, be witnesses in a Hong Kong trial. And so that uh, trial experience that I had in Newport Beach helped me greatly. I was also doing a lot of transactional work because this was before the handover of Hong Kong to mainland China. And many of the companies were investing in China, China through Hong Kong. So that's when I started to do some transactional work in Hong Kong. Then came an opportunity for me to move to Tokyo and I was seconded to Itochu Corporation, which is a conglomerate, uh, which I ended up joining years later, but as an in-house uh, lawyer seconded from a law firm. And I did that for about a year before moving to the San Francisco office of Squire Patton Boggs, because in order to be made a partner, I think it's customary that you spend time at your main office. And Graham and James, or now Squire Patton Boggs, is a San Francisco-based firm, so I decided to spend a couple of years uh, in San Francisco. There, I was doing mostly finance work. Uh, it was the time of the, the first internet bubble, and uh, there were a lot of financing work financing these startup companies. In 2000, I decided to move in-house and to join Itochu Corporation, uh, which was a client. And the reason that I decided to move in-house was because I really wanted to do more work on the ground. Rather than being in a law firm doing advisory work, I thought it would be really quite exciting to be working alongside our business people, putting together projects, traveling with them, and actually seeing through an entire project, including when the projects went wrong. So oftentimes, as an in-house lawyer, you end up looking at a contract that you drafted, which is now in dispute. Uh, that was actually quite exciting. Uh, Itochu Corporation, as I said, is a Fortune Global 500 company. Uh, we are in over 100 jurisdictions uh, with seven business lines, ranging from things like power, energy and chemicals, textile, food, uh, and other things. Uh, some of the more familiar brands to you may be uh, Dole, you know, the banana and pineapple Dole. Uh, that's an Itochu company. But we also have a power plant up here in uh, Albany. Uh, so we're really very diversified. I think trading company is probably a misnomer. Uh, in Japanese, it's a Sogo Shosha, but it's more a diversified industrials is probably the right word. So uh, as a legal person, in Itochu, what I did was uh, work on, of course, transactions, moving transactions forward. But eventually, when I became GC, general counsel of Itochu, I ended up being more, taking on more managerial roles and actually executive roles. So that means not just driving transactions forward, but thinking about many of the very important things that shape corporations today, such as corporate governance, what should a company be aspiring to, to do, uh, the value of the company, uh, things like that. And that actually uh, gave me a great experience in thinking about how I want to shape a company with my legal background. Um, two years ago, 
February two years ago, my then boss came to me and said, well, we want you to be in New York. Uh, and it's not going to be a legal role. Uh, and I'd never been outside the legal space, uh, so I was actually terrified. I thought it was going to be moving from the Word world to the Excel spreadsheet world. I've never really done Excel spreadsheet calculations. I don't know how those things work. Uh, but on the spot, I said, I thankfully accept. Um, oftentimes, people tell me, or I think uh, very sort of generically, people say that women tend to I guess, stay away from opportunities. They're more afraid of taking chances. And I really wanted to make a statement about that. So my conviction was that when an opportunity came for me, I would just grab that chance right away. So I decided that I would say, thank you, I'm accepting the position right away uh, by saying, that, saying yes at the spot. And when I went home, I told my husband that I was moving to New York. He wasn't very pleased about the fact that I didn't consult with him. But I think you know, he's happy and he followed me, so he's now a trailing spouse in New York. Um, in New York, Itochu International uh, is a subsidiary of Itochu Corporation, but it's a pretty big company by itself uh, in the US and Canada and Mexico because we cover North America. Asset-wise, it's about $2.2 billion, and we have over 11,000 employees on a consolidated basis. So, um, and of course, you know, 40 subsidiaries, subsidiaries of Itochu International. And my job is to ensure that these subsidiary companies grow, that North America is actually a very profitable, you know, block region. And uh, by going around these subsidiaries, making sure that those CEOs are aligned with our business objectives. Um, so, as I said, 30 years ago, I was here. Uh, and my first year civil procedure small section was led by, of course, Professor Claremont. By the way, one of the really nice things about being a graduate is that you get to call your professors by their first names. So I, I love being able to say Stuart or Kevin or Glenn uh, 30 years later. But of course, you know, back then, I was terrified. And they were all very important professors to me. So Professor Claremont. Uh, so Professor Claremont's civil procedure uh, was one of the classes that I had. Uh, of course, I took evidence and contract law with uh, Professor Hillman, Bob Hillman. So those three core courses were very, very important. Although, back then, I must confess, I don't think I understood civil procedure at all uh, until I graduated and maybe several years after graduation. Uh, upper, class, uh, upper class classes that helped me greatly eventually uh, were legal aid clinic. So Glenn led the legal aid clinic, uh, and I had some wonderful clinical uh, trial experiences. I remember one stormy winter, uh, I had the opportunity of arguing a case in front of, front of the appellate division of the Supreme Court of uh, the state of New York. And uh, I was practicing my oral argument. Glenn was driving, and this was the winter storm day. And we got lost because Glenn was driving, but at the same time, he was correcting me all the way that we were driving. And we're in the middle of the night, stuck, and the only thing that was sort of you know, going was my oral argument, uh, which was a great experience. Um, I also took product liability with Professor Henderson, of course, the product liability guru, which again became very helpful when I got to Hong Kong because many of the Japanese companies I was representing in Hong Kong were plaintiffs in counterfeit cases, um, suing Chinese companies that were manufacturing counterfeit goods in mainland China. So product liability uh, also became a very important subject matter for me. I should also mention that extracurricular activities were very, very important to me. Um, so I don't know why. Uh, Professor Claremont chose me as his TA for the undergraduate class that he was teaching together with Professor Hillman on something like the principles of legal theory at the university. But uh, it was my first experience teaching uh, the legal subject matter. Um, and eventually, years later, this would help me again because I ended up teaching at a Japanese law school. Um, I was also the president of the Asian 
Law Students Association. Uh, and I remember being very, very happy when we were able to invite uh, Mr. Korematsu, Mr. Fred Korematsu of Fred Korematsu versus the United States. So I guess everybody knows this case. Yes? OK, Kevin, Kevin knows the case. All right, good. <laughs> So we actually invited Mr. Korematsu to come to the law school to, for him to talk about his ex experience. That was actually wonderful. Um, I also was a voice student in the music department. So while I was not the best student in law school, uh, I was actually the best student in the music department. Uh, and uh, I say this because, uh, you know, especially the first years, I'm sure you're, you're working very hard, you're studying very hard, I remember, you know, studying, eating, and sleeping. And those were really the only things that I did my first year, especially because I lived in Hughes Hall. Everything was connected. Uh, everything was just centered around legal studies. Uh, and, you know, of course, you're here to study the law, but it's very important also to take time off uh, from the legal studies to do something that you really enjoy. And uh, I understand today that the, there's still the PIF Cabaret going, which is wonderful, because I also participated in the PIF Cabaret, which started, I think, uh, when I was a law student here as my first year student. Now, um, I'd like to talk about my litigation associate days. 1991, the economy was bad. Litigation was booming. There were all these lawsuits going on. The law firm that I joined, it was too busy handling all these cases. So they let me, a first year associate, handle a couple of lawsuits by myself, which when you think about it, is actually could be disastrous, but uh, they let me do that. Um, I remember talking to the managing partner of the law firm who told me that although even as a first year associate, sometimes you're expected to do client development, you have to really think about why you are in the law firm. So I think there's a lot of pressure to market, develop clients, but at the end of the day, it's almost like you're a car salesman. If you do not know how a car works, you can't really sell that car. And your job is really to be a good lawyer because you are selling that legal knowledge. Uh, and that actually you know, stuck with me all these uh, years. I think that's a great advice, uh, that uh, you're actually there to sell your legal skills, your legal knowledge. And even though eventually, as a partner, you may have to you know, do client development, you have to remember that your legal skills is really the best thing that you have. Uh, and I think that's why the legal theory that, or the legal theories that you learn here in law school are very, very important. I know that there's a debate going on amongst law schools, including Cornell Law School, as to how much theory should be taught versus practice. And I think as a law student, the practical side of things may look rosier than the legal theories. But as I said, at the end of the day, that's your base. That's your platform. Uh, and that's why legal theories are really the ones that uh, need to be focused on. Practice actually comes later. Uh, and that's something that you can learn uh, in your law firm, uh, throughout uh, your law firm career or otherwise. It's interesting that uh, through this uh, litigation practice, many of the things that I learned in law school, especially as a first year, became reality. So I remember reading this case in the civil procedure casebook about service of process. I remember that uh, whether it was an effective service or not, when over an airplane flying cross country, when the airplane actually reached a certain state, somebody tried to serve the papers on the potential defendant. Am I right, Kevin? And thank you. <laughs> Amazing. Uh, anyway, so you know those things actually became reality to me, uh, because as a first year litigation associate, oftentimes you are tasked with serving. Uh, a defendant. Uh, and I actually had a little bit of uh, the service uh, experience through the legal aid clinic, uh, trying to you know, serve a defendant. But in the law firm, I, I did the same. Uh, and one of the instances included trying to conceal a complaint in a bouquet of flowers 
having the flower shop deliver that. I don't know, and of course, you know, the person who accepted that without knowing that the paper was in there, I don't know whether that was effective service or not, but at least we claimed it was, and the lawsuit carried. Um, in contract, you probably learn past consideration is no consideration. Does that ring a bell? No? Past consideration, okay. It's one of the, the great contractual legal theories. Past consideration is no consideration. Anyway, so there was actually a lawsuit that I handled where my catchphrase was, past consideration is no consideration. Our client uh, went to the hospital and had surgery done. And after the surgery was done, the hospital decided to change the price of the medical fees. And of course, he didn't want to pay, came to us. And my argument was that that was past consideration, and past consideration is no consideration. Somehow the judge bought that, and uh, I won the case. It also tells you that uh, the legal theories that you learn in law school are not necessarily practice in reality. I also had another case down in San Diego where our client was a glass sheet manufacturer selling big sheets of glass, like the window glass. And when the, the sheet was delivered to the buyer, as the sheet was being unloaded, it fell to the ground, the glass shattered, and of course the buyer sued the seller, our client. And the question was, well, who should actually bear that risk of loss? Um, the plaintiff, the buyer, decided to introduce into evidence the picture of the shattered glass taken the next day so I'm sure that you are experts in evidence. What's wrong with that? What would be my objection? Well, it's evidence taken after the fact. You're not supposed to introduce that into evidence. So of course, I had my evidence code in front of me, and I was reciting that to the judge. And the judge knew that I was right, legally. But he said, oh, you know, I'm, I'm just going to let it in. So things like that happen in reality. Um, it was a good learning. Uh, experience. And also, I think in oral advocacy, you're told when you're approaching a witness to always seek permission from the judge. Your honor may approach the witness. And so I was doing everything by the book. And I think by the third time, the judge said, you can approach the witness as many times as you want without my permission. Uh, so, uh, so, you know, legal theories you learn in, in law school, and that's your bread and butter. But in reality, some of the things may change. When I moved to Hong Kong, I switched to more of the, the cross-border transactions. The only place that I'm admitted to practice law is California. So um, by being in a different jurisdiction, and, and by the way, I was in Hong Kong, I was in Tokyo, uh, I was in Southeast Asia, I was also negotiating deals in Europe, uh, Brazil, uh, South Africa, so all these jurisdictions that I'm not admitted, I think you know, being in those places, but still practicing, practicing, it sort of makes you think about you know, your value add. You know, what value can you add when you're practicing law in a jurisdiction that you're not admitted in? It really becomes not necessarily just your pure legal knowledge. It's not about you know, which code talks about, you know, evidence or civil procedure. It's really more about, um, I guess, the issues that you can spot, how you can problem solve things, uh, especially in a transaction, especially in the M&A situation. How can you drive that transaction forward for your client, but also for the other side? Um, I think, you know, maybe the same thing can be said about litigation too. Because at the end of the day, many of these cases go to, well, will we'll settle rather than going to um, litigation or trial eventually. Uh, so there has to be this mutual interest that needs to be met. And I think it's, it's wrong uh, to think that uh, you should just be you know, saying no to the other side all the time. The value add uh, as a lawyer is really how you can find that mutual interest and how you can find a solution. And I think, in my view, 
that is uh, what a good international lawyer does. I actually had a wonderful mentor when I was in San Francisco. She was, is, is probably by far the best negotiator that I have ever come across. Uh, she had two small boys who were constantly fighting. Uh, she was very busy juggling all these things. Uh, but I think because she had to always find solutions from those quarrels that the boys were having, she was this best problem solver, which she brought to her practice. Uh, I remember that uh, when a transaction successfully closed, the other side sent her flowers. Of course, you know, our client sent you know, her flowers too, but the other side sent flowers, which actually means a great deal for a lawyer to be applauded by the other side, who could eventually become your client for the next transaction. So you should remember that, you know, of course you should zealously represent your client, but at the end of the day, that doesn't necessarily mean saying no or becoming too aggressive to the other side. Uh, it's maybe sometimes better for both sides uh, to find a solution. And that's your job, I think, as a counselor. Integrity as a lawyer is another thing that is very, very important, especially in this day and age where compliance is such a hot topic. Many clients come to you with very difficult questions. Oftentimes, there is really no black or white answer. So in many cases, as a lawyer, the questions that you're asked are things that are not either very you know, extremely legal or legal or illegal. It's not that black and white. It's always somewhere in the gray zone. Um, and it would be insufficient, I believe, for a lawyer to say that, well, it's not illegal for you to do that, because anybody can say that. I think the advice that the client is looking for is much beyond that. Understanding the client, the understanding the client's culture, and based upon all of that, what you would recommend, again, as a counselor. And those are the skills that, uh, once you have mastered, of course, the, the basic knowledge of the law, uh, something that I think you need to, to acquire. Having said all of that, in the international setting, being a US lawyer greatly helps. I was just having a conversation with Eduardo about being a New York lawyer. So in many of my transactions that I dealt, um, in Southeast Asia, uh, in many other parts of the world other than the United States, oftentimes I saw New York law as the governing law of the contract. So it's either English law or New York law. Certainly there are exceptions. In China, most of the cases it would be the Chinese law. In Japan, I think Japanese companies will always ask for Japanese law. But in Southeast Asia, Europe, uh, Africa, uh, and to a certain extent in Latin America too, you oftentimes see New York law as the governing law. And I truly believe that uh, New York law is definitely one of the more heavily exported uh, products from the United States. So it helps to have this, uh, the legal knowledge based upon um, New York law. In 2000, I decided to leave uh, Graham and James to join Itochu Corporation in Tokyo. People thought I was crazy because I was moving from San Francisco to Tokyo. Um, I had a nice office in San Francisco. I had a secretary. Uh, my salary was pretty good, and I gave up all of that. Uh, my salary cut was probably by one third. I had no private office anymore, no secretary, just open space, no title. And my colleagues, especially in the, the law firm, thought I was crazy. What are you going to be doing? But I really wanted to be with a company that had exciting things going. Uh, as I said, Itoji is a conglomerate. It does business all over the world. Having been a secondi at the, the company, I knew what the company was doing. And I really wanted to be part of the business world. Uh, so I decided to, to join Itoju in 2000. 
Eventually, um, several years later, I became a GC for Itochu and then executive officer. So when I think about what were some of my biggest contributions to the company as a GC or executive officer, I think there may be two things. Um, I can recall in certain instances where I had to stop a transaction from proceeding. So by the way, for those of you who are interested in becoming in-house, it would really help to do some groundwork on where the legal department sits within the organization. Because some legal departments are very powerful, others are not. So there is really no one way a legal department functions. It's very, very important that you actually find that out and be, hopefully, in a legal department that has a voice. And fortunately, in my case, Itochu Corporation's legal department does have a voice. So of course, it moves transactions forward. But we saw as our really um, mission to stop transactions, which in our view were not beneficial to the company. I think another example is in shaping the company culture or corporate culture, and especially the compliance culture. Um, you know, in this day and day age, there are many compliance incidents that come up. And that's unfortunate, but that's reality. I don't think you can ever make compliance incidents zero. The more important thing is how do you actually deal with those incidents after the fact? Uh, the worst, worst thing than a compliance happening is trying to cover up that incident. And we have seen many companies who have failed as a result of trying to cover up compliance incidents. Do you actually seek leniency? Do you go for leniency? Um, how do you actually address that compliance issue? Although it may not necessarily have a monetary magnitude to that company. That's again, not a technically legal question because there is no law that says that you, know, you have to seek leniency in certain cases. It's very much a balancing act. Um, so those are the kind of things that I think um, you face uh, internally as GC and as an executive officer. And your way of approaching those issues are definitely shaped by the legal education, the legal community uh, that uh, surround you. So. Um, Two years ago, as I said, I was moved to a non-legal position. I was terrified uh, because, as I said, I still don't know how to prepare Excel spreadsheets. But becoming a CEO doesn't actually require spreadsheets, Excel spreadsheets. There are others who do that for you, which was probably the biggest surprise, my joy, that I found. Uh, so there are others who, who, who do all the calculation for you. In fact, I think moving from an in-house position to CEO is an easier move than a business person becoming a CEO, uh, especially in a company such as ours with all of these you know, different business lines. Um, as an in-house person, I've worked with all the business people and the departments. I know their business models. I know where the risks are. Uh, certain business divisions are more uh, likely to take risks, others are not. Uh, so things like that uh, you understand by being an in-house lawyer. So I think internally, with that, or that connection that you have, the knowledge you have, it's easier in my view for a business or an in-house lawyer to become a business person. But I think also externally, it's easier for a lawyer to be a CEO than maybe a business person. Because there are all these external factors, especially in the M&A area, that are very, very legally driven. Uh, you can look at a transactional risk more closely, I think, than a business person. So a business person may face, may receive a memo from an outside law, law firm setting out all these list, legal risks that may exist. And these business people may not necessarily know which are the more difficult legal risks uh, that may 
not necessarily be manageable by the company. But I think as a lawyer, you know the priority. You know certain risks that you can take, others you cannot take. And so that, from that perspective, I think the decision is easy. And also, recently, there have been a lot of talk about CFIUS, national security concerns. Our firm is not a private equity firm, but uh, our, one of our business models is in acquiring other companies. So M&A is very, very important. And recently, especially last year, 2018, we saw a number of transactions that, uh, so transactions where we are trying to sell our business to other, which got blocked because the buyer, the potential buyer, uh, was a company from a CFIUS perspective provided posed national security threats to the United States. Now, whether I agree with that or not, uh, aside, I think you know, there are more and more issues coming out that are legally driven, where as a lawyer, you can foresee the transactional risk, whether a transaction would actually close after a contract is signed. Uh, another area is antitrust. So we just acquired another company, and uh, we realized that because the company we acquired is a competitor of ours, we need to be very cognizant of antitrust issues, um, how to set up firewalls between some of the business departments where we're trying to integrate. Um, again, this is the kind of thing that is a post-merger integration issue. But I think as a lawyer, I am probably better equipped to understand the importance of that and to ensure that that is set in place. Interestingly enough, the economic outlook and how you look at the economy is also uh, very sort of legally driven in my case. So there are talks about how the stock market is going to do going forward if there are stricter privacy laws here in the United States as the ones that we see in Europe. Uh, there's a lot of talk about activism, shareholder activism. So if you compare the number from last year and the year before, there are more and more activists. So shareholders with, you know, who want to um, ask companies to do certain things. The number is increasing, not just in the United States, but also worldwide. And again, as I think as a lawyer, you are sort of, you know, much more attuned to that kind of issue. There are a lot of law firm newsletters coming out talking about shareholder activism. Uh, and based upon this information, uh, I see it as my role to make sure that we're not only reacting to shareholder activism, but um, working with my management to ensure that we have a, a very healthy dialogue going on with all of our shareholders, um, whether investors or individual, uh, so that um, um, we're not one day surprised by uh, a shareholder activist all of a sudden proposing something out of the blue. So extracurricular activities. Um, thanks to Professor Claremont and Hillman, I was able to teach for the first time in law school. Uh, and that experience actually dealt, uh, eventually turned into a teaching opportunity in Japan for me, teaching a contract law class at Keio Law School. Uh, using Professor Hillman's uh, principles of um, basic contract law, I think it is. Uh, and uh, my, my law students were really excited uh, learning from that book. Uh, and of course, you know, the, one of the more important um, concepts in contract law is this reasonable person test. Uh, and we actually ended up calling this reasonable person Reasonable Bob after Bob Hillman. Uh, so every single time I would ask my class, so what do you think reasonable Bob would think at this juncture? And that was always, you know, uh, how uh, reasonable Bob was used in place of reasonable person. And I understand that uh, in his office today, there's this plaque that says reasonable Bob. Uh, and uh, he's very proud of that. But uh, that actually uh, uh, was something that uh, uh, us in Tokyo created. Um, so uh, as I said, when I was here at uh, the law school, uh, we invited Mr. Korematsu to come and speak. 
uh, it so happens that last year, uh, January 30th, New York City made uh, January 30th uh, the Fred Korematsu Day. And I went to the event, uh, met the daughter of uh, Mr. Korematsu, uh, and it was actually quite a nostalgic to meet somebody, um, uh, you know, who, who's a daughter of Mr. Korematsu that we had the pleasure of inviting. So another connection to uh, Cornell Law School. Um, I continued to sing. Um, as I said, I used to sing in the music department. I still continue to sing. There is a great New York City bar building in New York City. Does anybody know where this is? OK, well, OK, the professors know. So West 44th between 5th and 6th, across the street from the Harvard Club, there is this historical building, and it says City Bar. Um, and on the second floor, there is a great hall where you can have concerts. And every month, there is a chamber music series going. And it's all these lawyers who are also musicians at the same time. So you'd be amazed how many musicians there are who are also lawyers, or lawyers who happen to be musicians. Um, I think uh, you know, being in the legal profession is a stressful uh, thing. And uh, it's sometimes good to let out your stress by singing or doing something that you really enjoy. So I think in conclusion, I sort of asked my, myself this question of what does it mean for me to be a lawyer in the best sense? Um, again, I think it's a very tough, uh, thought-provoking, tough uh, question. Uh, it's very, very personal. But I think um, the word sense is very, very important. Um, it's something that I think changes over time as well as your career progresses. Uh, but in my case, I think being a lawyer in the best sense means, of course, you need legal knowledge. You have to have the legal knowledge. You have to have the ability to solve problems. Um, you have to have a better understanding of what's going on around you rather than just the black letter law. Um, hopefully, you can shape an organization, especially if you're an in-house person, based upon your integrity as a member of the legal profession. Um, and hopefully, you can also contribute to society. You can give back to society. Uh, in my case, I, I felt like I was giving something back when I was teaching at law. Uh, I also felt that I was, you know, being part of the, the civil rights movement by inviting Mr. Fort Korematsu and also now in New York City being part of that um, organization. And I think most importantly, you have to be satisfied. You have to be happy. Um, otherwise, I think uh, you, there is really no way forward. Uh, and those are my thoughts for, I guess, looking back my 30 years. Uh, but everything started here on this campus, and for which I'm very, very grateful. So thank you very much. I think we have probably five minutes or so left. Uh, if there are any questions, I'd be happy to. Yes, Stuart? So I try not to, you know, step into that person's shoes. Of course, my, I like legal issues, um, and I try not to take away his job. Um, I respect him, uh, but I think, uh, you know, he's my junior too. So to the extent that I see certain things that it can, can be improved, um, I do talk to him on the side. I'm probably more interested in legal issues, but I try to stay away. Yet, when it's necessary, I'll step in. Kevin, yes. No, I did not. <laughs> in New York. You know, it's interesting that um, I don't. It's a it's a completely open office. Uh, which I think is wonderful. It's sort of like the Silicon Valley, you know, open space. Uh, 
In my view, I think communication is better. Uh, when I had my own office in a law firm, I really didn't know what my, my neighbor was doing. Uh, sometimes it's distracting, but communication flows, in my view, easily in an open office environment. My question was, you know, I mean, that's why it's career perspective. Um, but you also have phenomenal language. So I'm smiling with embarrassment because as a very naive first year law student, I remember 30 years ago raising my hand in Kevin's class and I said, doesn't judgment have an E after the, <laughs> and uh, rather than snapping back, no, you actually gave an answer, which of course I don't remember, but I was actually quite uh, later on mortified about the stupidity of my question, but uh, thankful for the fact that, uh, you know, he, he just didn't, he actually, I don't know, respect it is the right word, but uh, he answered my question. But anyway, um, I don't think it's the language ability, I think it's the communication ability. Um, especially in an international setting. Uh, sometimes it doesn't really matter how, how good an English you speak or Japanese or whatever language, you, the, 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 your client or the other side, they may not speak the same language as you anyway. So how do you actually communicate beyond the, the language itself? Uh, how do you communicate, but even in English, how do you diff communicate difficult concepts? Um, paraphrasing, drawing whiteboards, whatever. Uh, you know, placing yourself in the other person's shoe and trying to uh, get across the message is the more important thing than the language ability itself, I think. Yes. So I wanted to be a, um, I wanted to be on the Pacific, uh, I wanted to be on the West Coast side. I thought for some reason that that was actually better to do uh, work in Asia, at least back in 1991. Today, of course, it's not the same. And I think in retrospect, I, I should have probably taken the New York bar. Uh, somehow it appealed to me to go to California and especially Southern California after Ithaca, I don't know why. <laughs> yes, Glenn. Uh, I don't have anything in mind, although you mentioned one thing you thought would make interesting to do your part in the first. Are there any things looking back now that you think maybe you should have done something differently? That's a very good question. Um, it was already too late. Uh, when I came to law school, but I think, um, so the reason why I found law school difficult, in my view, is because I came straight from college to law school. I had no real life experience, and I didn't even know what law school was all about. I was a political science major. I loved talking about political philosophy. I, saw, I thought law school was a place where you talked about the role of society, role of law, you know, role of citizens. Uh, when I came here, it was nothing like that. Um, so it might have helped if I had some real life experience before I came to law school. Uh, to me, everything was just in the books. And I still remember a year after civil procedure, I still didn't understand the difference between substantive law and procedural law. So, but, and I'm sure all of you understand what that, that is, uh, but uh, things like that. Substance and procedure, what's the difference? It was a big question mark to me. Um, so that's something that I probably would have done differently. Of course, that's before law school. Yeah. 
So I think, um, especially Japan and Asia, other Asian countries too, maybe those cultures cultures are places where um, there are a lot of stereotypes. Um, you may be treated differently because you, you may be too young, you may be too old, you may be you know the wrong gender, uh, whatever. Um, and I think what is very important is not to be boxed in by others. So to how, somehow maintain your identity in terms of who you are, what your core strengths are. It's not easy to do that. Uh, so once I moved back to Japan, all of a sudden I was made very much aware of the fact that I'm a woman. You know, the newspapers talked about how Claire became the first female executive officer at, the, at a young age. And so, you know, they talk about gender all the time. Newspapers always have the age. Um, and by the time, by the way, I was 40, really 46 when I became an executive officer. So that's not young by any European standard. By, by Japanese standard, 46 was considered to be extremely young. Um, so how do you actually take yourself out of that box that others are trying to box you in? And I think uh, one way to do that is really uh, by being uh, part of other communities. So rather than always spending time with your colleagues, uh, you know, participating in Cornell Law School alumni event or just being outside of the office environment so that you're not in one stereotypical community. But I wouldn't necessarily fight, fight that, because fighting can cause other obstacles, right? So you don't fight, but you let the, out the stress elsewhere by being part of other communities that you feel comfortable. I actually joined a, an organization called the Foreign Lawyer, Women Lawyers Association when I was in Tokyo. So I was able to speak in English and I was amongst other female lawyers. Thank you.